Hey, it's Metal Dave, along with my co-host, Jason McMaster, bringing you another episode of the Talk Louder podcast. Our guest today is musician Christian Shields. Uh, he is based here in Austin, a uh, hard rock guy, um, has some new music coming out. By the time you hear this, it'll be out. You can go to his website, ChristianShieldsRocks.com. He's got great videos and sound bites and songs and all that stuff if you uh, want to find out what he's all about. He is also playing our very own Jason McMaster in an upcoming movie called Bloody and Bruised, The Untold Story of the Back Room. It is a documentary about the legendary back room music venue uh, here in Austin. It's been closed for a number of years, but it had a great run of 30, 35 years, something like that. A lot of bands went through there, including Dangerous Toys. Uh, so Christian was called to play the role of a young Jason McMaster in that movie. So we talk a little bit about that as well. Uh, fun guy, man. He's got a lot of energy. Yeah, he'll wear you out. <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's that's a good thing. It's um, a great thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm just, um, you know, he w didn't come on my radar until, until that, you know, he, he posted <laughs> the invoice from his day sheet from his uh his you know he was technically an extra on the film right mm -hmm. he posts that i saw my name on there i'm like what is this you know it kind of freaked me out we talk about that and that's how uh christian came on my radar at all um i had already known about the movie and uh had already been interviewed for the movie but uh didn't understand the actual ideas that they were doing as far as reenactments you know right. things that went down at the back room whether they be a musical performance or not <laughs> they, right. were, they were reenacting shit that they probably shouldn't have reenacted <laughs> that are in the movie that some people might might find very interesting and i'm just like why oh oh geez you know well that's it's appropriately named bloody and bruised so. yeah I, I, that's fine that's fine it'll be fun i realize i realize that it's fun and it and it's about not one thing it's about a culture and right. that's that's the focus right um so so yeah christian uh and you know he's open for the toys uh and uh and shit everybody else that has come through here he's uh like you said he's a go-getter uh he writes a good solid four on the floor style of rock and roll he's a giant kiss fan i think that's obvious in his music yeah. um he uh quotes paul stanley quite often and uh i think that that's kind of cool too i mean oh, he's not like uh he's not like you know making phone calls going oh yeah, yeah wow <laughs> you know he's, but i wish he would uh <laughs> um but it was fun having him on the show today uh ladies and gents freaks and germs mr christian shields today on the talk louder podcast <laughs> what's up christian thanks for joining us how are you man what's going on thanks for having me guys i'm good yeah um it, timely timely episode here today because if i if i understand correctly you got some new music coming out any day now is that right yeah i got a new single called raise them up coming out this friday november 10th with a video it's gonna be good i'm excited Nice. Yeah. I've been poking around on your website. You do a great job with your, uh, with your social media, your website looks great. Your YouTube channel looks great. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> how many albums do you have to your credit? I just have one right now. Um, I think, uh, the new direction of the, the industry as a whole, especially for artists that don't have large fan bases, I think it's to go back to a single approach. Uh, we can talk about more of that a little bit later, but uh, just one for now, but I don't have plans to do another one. I'd rather just do uh, songs with videos, maybe three, four songs a year. That's kind of like where my headspace is at. None of that's your fault. No. Yeah, you're, I, you're I, I mean, making making ends meet is what is part of the game now. I'm sure that anybody who isn't any kind of artist, you know, um, it's almost a, to the fact of, uh, you know, I'm just riffing here, but if you were an author, it would almost be the same as writing a short story, right? Instead of a novel or right, right? having a 30 yeah. minute vignette of something, uh, you know, as a proposal to a film festival, as opposed to an entire movie 
but I'm glad that it hadn't gotten that because I'm a movie freak and I would hate to go see, well, that was, you know, $18 to see a 30 minute movie, you know? I, I get that. And, uh, you know, I'm an album guy myself. Like, you know, I, I love, you know, listening to a lot of the old, you know, we say old, what is old now, but we listen to, you know, I, I like listening to records front to back. You know, there's a lot of hidden gems on there, but as far as like catching people's attention and the tools that we have at our disposal, the technology, you know, most people aren't going to add a full album to their playlists, you know, especially because, you know, the age of streaming and all that stuff, or even YouTube, which is the biggest social media platform. People aren't putting a whole album's worth of videos in their playlist. They're only putting one song. So, you know, it when we talk about making ends meet, you know, the music now is more like an advertisement and then you want to make money on the, or, or you make your, your money on the back end at shows. So how I, my thought process is, is how do I reach the maximum amount of eyeballs or earballs and get them to come to a show and then, you know, kind of develop that pipeline for the fan base. And, um, you know, I know I do have fans that want, you know, to hear like a full length record, but then like you said, you know, it's, 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 it's money. And, um, you know, if you can't make money on it, it doesn't make sense. So that's just my, if it makes sense, I'll do it. It's interesting too, just to add that, um, if you do make a full record or, you know, f between four to eight songs, which that's an EP and then a full record, just as far mm -hmm. as time, time goes, um, and it is licensed for any digital platform, eventually it ends up all on YouTube anyway for free. Yeah. You know, it just has a photo of the album cover and then you can hear the whole record on, on YouTube for free. But that's a, you know, that's a deal that sort of ha has been um, out of our control as artists. You know, it just ends up that way. You can just go, oh, I'll just go listen to it on YouTube. And people do. And they, that is a kind of stinky or a cheap shot uh, at artists because, and, and no one really complains about that. You don't hear, I know I haven't really publicly complained about, you know, oh, have you heard my new record yet? Oh man, where can I find it? Well, it's free on YouTube, apparently. You know what I mean? But that's about as bitchy as I get about it. But yeah, as soon as you license it to anyone, it ends up, for some reason, everybody has a deal with YouTube. YouTube is like the king of of what's going on with digital uh platforms yeah I yeah mean, absolutely yeah you can watch movies you know i yeah. bet the the artist the 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 uh the writer or the playwright whatever who made who wrote and made them produced a movie probably doesn't have any say about what full length two hour movie is just free on youtube uh unless they license the movie to someone who is you know a big shot yeah, I bet they're in bed with YouTube. So it's just interesting little little stuff while we're while we're talking about it. But yeah, we can good. definitely go down we can yeah. definitely go down the rabbit hole. Oh, oh this, yeah. Jason. Oh yeah, it could be could be a mistake. So uh I wanted to ask you what brought you're from Rhode Island. What brought you to Austin? So it's a bit of a long story, but I'll try to condense it as much as I can. So um I had a uh, an actual hair metal band in 2000 between 2010 and 2013 called Dreamer up in Rhode Island and how that came to be is I had another band called Last One Standing and this producer uh from New York liked what he heard but he thought that you know the sound wasn't quite developed so we we went to New York to make an album it was called Turn It Up it's probably out there on YouTube you can find it <laughs> Which but is, uh yeah. he he we morphed the band from last one standing to dreamer and then i spent you know three years you know playing you know opening for bigger bands uh you know building a a substant a, a, a sizable fan base up there and we actually got contacted by roadrunner records now come to find out it was an intern who worked at roadrunner records uh but still you know we got all excited but when you know he's like i can't do anything the label's not interested well then the band fell apart right because everybody was like, oh, that was our one shot. Everybody quit. So I actually, at that point, you know, got a full-time job working for the electric company up there and just stopped doing music. Well, out of the blue, that same producer who did the Dreamer record called me up in 2015. And he said, he goes, hey, what are you doing? He goes, I see you're not really doing music anymore. I was like, ah, no, I'm done. Like I'd even cut my hair short and everything. 
And he goes, you're not done. He goes, get back together with your brother and come to Austin. He goes, this is where it's happening. He's like, you know, put a band together. We'll do an EP or a record and start, you know, building up, you know, things down here. So I thought about it and, you know, not to make a long story longer, but I ended up getting laid off from the electric company. So I said, oh, screw it. I'm going to Austin. And then here I am. Yeah, it's interesting that we've got basically two different generations of of guys here doing music, Jason and, and Christian. Jason's from the day, obviously, where, um, you know, you, you got noticed by playing a live show and then you got signed to a major label. And then the things that come with it, the tours, you know, the videos on MTV, that sort of thing. Christian now is of the generation where it's much more DIY. Um, you're, as you said earlier, it, it makes more sense to release singles rather than try to put together a whole album. So it, it's interesting here, the contrast, because you're both, you know, in Austin, Austin based. But Jason comes from a, a generation where the approach towards making it, I guess, is was different than it is now. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see. And, you know, he's Jason, somebody I, I look up to and I can call him a friend now since we've had lunch. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's it's just interesting, you know, uh, the dichotomy, you know, like the, the, the two different worlds. But, um, you know, just people it's kind of like you got to evolve or you die. You know what I mean? It's it's survival of the fittest, you know, as much yeah. as, you know, everybody wants to talk about the scene and camaraderie. And it's like, yeah, that that exists. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you got to figure out what's best for you, you know. So for people that aren't familiar with your music, how how would you describe your sound? Hard rock. Yeah. I I hear uh I hear a lot of 80s influence in there and which is always interesting to me because I grew up on that sort of thing. You're much younger than we are. Um so I always find it interesting when people find their inspiration from a generation that I wouldn't think was necessarily the generation that would inspire you. Well, uh, you know, the reason why I know there's a lot of 80s influence, but the reason why I don't say 80s metal is because before I even discovered any of the stuff from the 80s, because my dad is a huge metal, hard rock fan, yada, yada, yada. And so is my mom. But you're like, you know, my first band was Kiss. That's what I discovered. So um, for me, you know, they were they're hard rock. You know, they're yeah. not a hair band, even though in the 80s they might have been labeled that. But that's where I started was old school classic rock or hard rock. So Kiss, Zeppelin, Sabbath, all that stuff from from my dad. And then it just kind of migrated from there as I would just discover more and more music. Yeah. Yeah. I hear all those influences and and I love it. It's it's very uh, it's melodic, but it's got some chunk. You know, it's it, it's just good, straightforward, hard rock. And you, you. so you mentioned your parents. So I was going to ask if, if you come from a musical background, musical family, uh, who, you know, did, did your family members inspire you? When did you get your first guitar? Take us back to little Christian being five years old, growing up at home. What's it sound like? Well, it actually, so when I was six, I actually started with playing the clarinet in, this, in first grade. Uh, I don't really recall what got me into that, but, you know, I played music for a little bit. And then when I was 11, my dad got excited because he got his hands on a, like a, a bunch of bootleg tip, uh, a bunch of bootleg tapes, sorry, VHS tapes, if people remember those, of Kiss concerts from the, from the 1970s. And there was two concerts in particular that I would watch over and over. There was one from Largo, Maryland on the Dynasty Tour in 79, I think. And mm -hmm. then there was one, and this was the one that did it for me, was night two of the Love Gun Tour at Houston, Texas at the Summit, September 2nd, 1977. And yeah. I'm weird where I remember dates and everything. And I just remember my dad putting it on and you see them come down the risers and they're opening with I stole your love and Paul's doing the big hand motions and everything. And I was like, what is this? You know, you got the pyro going off all that. And then when they start off the song, he's strumming chords and pointing to the, the girls in the front row. And I was like, I was like, I want to do that. And that that's that's what got me into it. So then I saved up as much money as I could. And for my 12th birthday, I bought my first guitar. But to, to take it back to what you're saying. My parents are not musical at all. Uh, my dad wanted to play guitar when he was a kid, but uh, he said he never got the encouragement from his parents. So once I got interested into it, and then I told my brother he's playing drums, uh, once we got into music, my dad did everything to make it happen. Like he spent, oh, it'd probably make you sick how much money he spent on us. <laughs> 
Oh, I'm sure I have a 15 year old son. He knows myself. all about it. I know all about it. <laughs> yeah. So is your brother, your current drummer? No, my brother, uh, he's doing his own thing. We'll just leave it at that. Okay. Is he still in Texas? Yeah. He lives up in Coffers Cove. Okay. All right. So, um, what was the, so the Kiss uh, VHS tapes, I've seen both of the shows that you're talking about and I can see why, I mean, Kiss was the band for me too. And, and definitely one of the bands for Jason. Um, and the two shows you're talking about, that's a lot of eye candy and a lot of ear candy for a young brain. Um, so I can see why that took hold. And then, so how did you go about, uh, you know, playing, playing your first gigs or making a name for yourself early on? And how old were you at that time? So my first show would have been December 3rd, 2005. Uh, there's not a lot of venues in Rhode Island. There never has been. Um, and especially for kids, like, you know, we can't play clubs. So what was I? I was so freshman year of high school I was 14 and, or 15. And uh, yeah, 14 since 2005. Um, and what we did was we rented out the local Elks Club. And I would just pass out flyers to all my, my high school friends. We made an EP and everybody bought it. And we packed the place. We had like 180 people show up, if I recall. And uh, but the only tragic thing about that night is because it was around Christmas time. We had a couple kids, haters that hated us, that decided to go across the street and trash somebody's uh, Christmas decorations. So all the money we made for the show, we had to pay them for all the decorations that got trashed. So we made no money. But I was still like, this is cool. This is awesome. And then that started. And then that was with Last One Standing. We kind of played a lot of clubs. But really, when I turned 18, 19, when I went from last one standing to, to dreamer, that's when we started getting, you know, able to offer, you know, play for bigger bands and stuff like that. That's where I opened for Hawthorne Heights, Hollywood of dead, all that remained. It was mostly hard rock. Cause around that time, 2010, 2011, 2012, even 2013, a lot of the hard rock eighties bands that are touring now, they weren't touring at the time. So it was still like the tail end of the emo wave. Um, you know, a lot of different alternative indie genres. So we would just take any show we could and uh, we would just win people over. And uh, cause everybody would always say, Oh man, you know, this sounds like a throwback to, to this, this, it was like that nostalgia factor, which was never really my intention. I just wanted to play music that had to do with, with my roots, you know, like I just write however I feel, but that's kind of like how, how we did it. And, you know, we played all over new England, did some shows in New York, all that stuff. And then, you know, ipso facto, here we are. It's kind of interesting. I just wanted to comment uh, off of something that, that you said. Uh, you know, the time and the climate. You think about how a lot of the hard rock, uh, you know, metal, whatever, hair bands or whatever, there was, you know, the musical uh, landscape had changed quite a bit in the 90s and in the early 2000s. And uh, if you're writing straight ahead rock and roll, it's kind of like, you are the alternative, your alternative music to what's happening on the radio and on MTV and even fashion and where the, where the wind is blowing the dollar bill is where all the sheep are going. So mm -hmm. if you're just, you know, doing it because you like it and, you know, I hate this, but wearing, you know, dressing and sounding and looking and feeling the way you choose that's commendable as hell, especially from, you know, the mid nineties all the way to, uh, you know, 2010 or whatever, when you kind of think about what was happening then. And a lot of the bands that you mentioned that you opened, that you opened for, um, it might've been refreshing for some people, uh, to see a band, like to see you do what you were doing in front of Hollywood undead. You yeah. know, it's probably this, yeah strange yin and yang kind of thing but you know everything yeah. comes from somewhere and you're more like you you would have been the roots rocker on the bill you know what yeah. i mean which sounds odd to say but it's kind of it's kind of right four on the yeah, floor ver versus you know mo modern uh rap rock or whatever it right. was right so yeah. so it's interesting uh to kind of think about it, but but what I thought, I thought about this the other day, whether it's relevant or not, I just want to vomit here. Um, I think it's important to remember for guys like my age and Dave, maybe we, we got to see, you know, Motorhead in a club. We got to see Anthrax in a club. We got to see Dio in a club. Would have been incredible. Uh, 
Yeah. Well, it's, it's true. It's fact. And, um, it, it, uh, that was the best thing probably about the, uh, you know, taking a back seat, you know, heavy metal, I'll just generalize taking a back seat during a time where, um, you know, the money in the industry was still merging labels emerging. It was just becoming publish publishing companies. It was not really in any developmental deals. Um, n- no one was getting paid to go write songs and demo out a new record because someone upstairs thought you were okay. That shit was over all during that time. So if you weren't somebody at that, during that time, you didn't, have a chance so um just the fact that someone wants to do what they want to do when it's kind of like you know skid row you know bum town where you're just like who you know who gives a shit about this you know what i mean well i do and i'm you know if you'll give me a chance i'll play you know i'll I'll have a good time open you know i want to get your uh let me let me open your show and have a good time. So obviously you're a go getter because you were you were on top of that whole thing and you you were doing it because you wanted to do it, not because uh, maybe there were managers or publishers or labels there to see you because they weren't. Sorry to say. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. And, no, you're absolutely right. And it was crazy because yeah, it was crazy because like going back to what you said about opening for Hollywood Undead it was crazy that those guys were backstage at the beginning of our set. And then at the end of the set, they'd come out and then we were hanging out with them after the show. They're like, you guys remind us of this. You guys are good because the way that my brain works, just to give you a little bit in thing. Cause like, obviously I wear all the hats, I'm a booking agent, I'm a manager, I'm a producer, whatever down the line. Now eventually, sure. It'd be nice to outsource some of those responsibilities so I could focus on other things. But you know, you know, a lot of people that I've talked to, like, you know, big agents and managers, they're like, Where's the money to be made? It's like, I get it, but you know, anyway, but, um, you know, I look at it this way. You have one chance to make an impact at a show. Those are people that are not there to see you. They're there to see the other band. Right. So, and this goes back to even only releasing one song. This is where it all ties together. How do I like that kiss video within five seconds, maximum impact visually, sonically, everything. Cause people listen with their eyes. How do I get these people? interested and you don't get everybody but i've played all kinds of crowds as i'm sure you have jason where you know some people they just stand there like this but it doesn't mean they're not interested a lot of times they're listening and honestly those are the crowds where i get the most fans from versus people that are jumping around having a good time it's 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 such a weird weird thing but you know so what if i have to dress up a little silly or whatever but it's like look you're an entertainer right if if you know if i wanted to just play the the record or whatever that i or i would just the fans would just stay home and listen to the record. Like, why do they need to come to the show? You have to make it an experience. It's a show, you know? Yeah. And and that's one thing I think, uh, you know, a lot of bands that go up there in jeans and T-shirts, no offense to anybody, whatever, I get it. Um, to use that old adage that, you know, Paul and Gene would say from Kiss, it's just that you got you to gotta leave something there. You got to leave the fans value for their dollar. That's That's what I try to do. Well, good thing they had good songs to go with that because good good songs too you need that yeah yeah i think that it's important that to you know i think that you're exactly right that people people's attention spans are short and they're getting shorter unfortunately so if you've got something for them to look at that's great but usually in my opinion if they hear something and they're attracted to it their eyes will start looking for what it is they're hearing so that's where the songs are very, very important. You know, the production of, of how your of how your song is basically sonically laid out, I think is very important. So I'm not saying that the look is secondary. I think that you're 100% correct, but put the song up there as much as it is, is what they're going to see once their eyes, once your eyes meet you, what's their eyes meet yours, because, uh, you need to be able to sing that song into their soul. And if the song is not so hot, you can't really, you can't get in there. Right. It's going to be and that's easy, why I tried, it's going to be yeah, easy the, for them to ignore it is all. Yeah. Yeah. No, I agree with you. And, yeah. and like to talk about the songwriting aspect, um, you know, I don't write songs for other musicians. Like right. we talked about this. 
I don't care if I'm playing an A chord four minutes straight, just blah, whatever. It doesn't care. Does this song rock? Does this song move you? Does this song make you feel something? You know, you get, you get a lot of people that like, you know, I get the whole prog thing and all that and it's cool, but like I get fatigued listening to a lot of those records front to back. It's like, I just want a straight ahead groove. I'm driving. I don't want to think about anything. I just want the song to rock. And even live, you know, you're playing a big venue. If the sound's not optimal, whatever, I want to leave as much space in the song as well, not clouded up with a bunch of different things. So it's like the arena rock approach. I think Def Leppard talked about this in one of their documentaries, right? It's about, you, you got to think you're playing a venue. You want people to be able to hear everything, right? Mm -hmm. So that's kind of like my approach as well. And it's not really like a conscious thing. I'm not like, let me sit down and write this song this way. No, it's just that I'm like, I write stuff that I enjoy. If I don't enjoy it, I move on. Important. Yeah. Important stuff here. Yeah, you sound like uh, you're saying something that maybe Sammy Hagar would say as well. well and, even, and, and, you know, I think that leaving space is important because uh, that definitely solidifies a style that you're kind of going for. So it says a lot for listeners and people who might be watching about what they might be in store for if they search, you know, research some of your music because... You're giving it great, uh, you're you're describing at great length what it's supposed to feel like. I do my yeah. best. <laughs> I, I, saw, uh, I saw Christian open for Faster Pussycat and I went up to him afterwards and I had never heard of him before. And I was, and he, so I, I get there, I'm a big Faster Pussycat fan, but uh, you know, I get there in time to see the opening act and I'm like, wow, these guys are really good and they're local. And and so you you were talking earlier about opening for Hawthorne Heights and Hollywood Undead. Well, then the the the, the climate shifted a little bit and some of those 80s bands uh, started touring again. You said earlier they kind of shut down for a little for a little while, but then they came back and then I see you opening all those gigs. Like who are you, who are some of the bands you've you've opened for recently? So, cause I think they're good matches and I want people to kind of get a sense of what you're really about. So Striper, um, Faster Pussycat, like you said, uh, Jackal, Anvil, and uh, Pop, like Power Man 5000. I know it's not 80s, but that's really all I've done with this project. Um, there hasn't been too many that have come through Austin. A lot of them come through San Antonio. Yeah. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to get on those shows because I don't have uh, any connections down there, unfortunately. But um, the the definite, the one that went over gangbusters for sure was, was Striper. That was huge. Yeah. Uh, and that was at Hotspot, right? Pretty good sized venue. Yeah. So, so I so see you're attached. The, I'm sorry to interrupt. So your name, Christian Shields, sounds like, and please forgive me, sounds like Christian rock. So That's would like work great in front of Striper. Ah, but then, well, like, got, but then you open for these guys that grab their dicks on stage, faster pussycat, dangerous toys yeah. and shit like that. Yeah, dangerous toys. And yeah. then you're opening yeah. for these like, uh, you know, Hesher metal bands like like Anvil that are sort of all over the place and uh, that are still rock and roll because a lot of their riffs are very remind me of old. Like it's like Ted Nugent on speed. You know, yeah. it's like. It's like heavy metal versions of like Sammy Hagar and 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 uh, Ted Nugent, you know, seventies rock, just with double mm -hmm. kick. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, the the point that I'm making is, uh, you you just to be clear, Christian Shields, which sounds like Christian rock. Of course, I've gotten that many times. Yeah, you're not you're not necessarily Christian rock. No, no, it's just that the name that. Um, so just to give you a little bit how I came up with the name, because that's not my real name, of course, but. I wanted a name that was memorable, right? Like, you know, like obviously Paul Stanley, Gene Simmons, you know, Ace Frehley, that's not their real names. So I was thinking of, I wanted something that people would be like, yeah, I've heard of that before. So a lot of times, because my real name, Christopher, when they print it on like a bill or something, they'll just put C-H-R-I-S-T. So back in the old days, old days, 2010, 11, 12, 13, when I was doing Dreamer, a lot of times you were still paying bills over the phone. You weren't really paying stuff over the internet yet. So I'd call up, you know, to pay a bill with my credit card or whatever. And they'd say, Christian. And I'm like, no, my name's Christopher. They're like, oh, sorry. They put C-H-R-I-S-T. So I kept hearing it over and over again. And then I think around that time, Fifty Shades of Grey came out. And this is going to be so lame. But Christian Grey, every girl was obsessed with the name Christian. And then I also thought, I'm like, well, Christian is a very recognizable word because of the religion. So I said, you know what? Christian. That's my first name. 
So I was going to, my middle name is Michael and I was going to call myself Christian Michaels, but I was like, ah, this is Brett Michaels, whatever. So we were sitting around the dinner table one night, my father, my brother and I, and my dad was like, what about Shields? I was like, where'd you come up with that? And he said, well, my grandmother's maiden name was Shields. So that's how I came up with it. I and like it just it. sounds like a good, a good name to be, well, to, and it's I wanted, family so name, family name. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So I wanted something that was marketable and recognizable. So like, again, like, you know, like when Paul Stanley says kiss, oh yeah, I've heard of that. Like people don't, you know what I mean? It's kind of like Christian. Oh yeah, I've heard of that. You know, whatever. And believe yeah. me, I get it all the time. And I'm just like, whatever. I just let people think what they want. I don't spend time trying to correct people. It's like, if they're interested, they're interested. If they're not, they're not. I mean, what am I going to do? You know? I see, uh, I see your name attached to a lot of these bills where like we've discussed, you open for, you know, Striper, Power Man, uh, mm -hmm. faster, dangerous toys, that sort of thing. But I, yeah. I, maybe I'm ignorant, but I don't see, I don't see your name. I don't see you headlining like a lot of your own shows. You kind of go after these opening slots. Is, is that, is that an accurate assessment? And if so, is it easier or better? Well, it's probably better to get a bigger audience, but it seems to me that you kind of start doing the club thing and then you get graduate to headliner and then maybe you start opening for some of the road bands. So what's your approach? Cause you're, you seem to be doing it differently. Well, I do a little bit of everything. So the problem with a lot of the headline shows, I've done headline shows at Pflugerville, you know, I've done headline shows, you know, in Austin is obviously visibility because clearly you haven't seen some of the ones that I've done. And, you know, if I headline a show, you know, 40, 50 people come out, whatever. Um, but like, obviously I want to attach my name to the bigger shows to try to, to borrow their fans, as I like to say, you know, cause you don't just like one band, you know, I walk around, pass out QR codes, email, try to get people on the email list. So I do that. And then every six months or so I'll do another headline gig, see who comes out to gauge the temperature of the fan base. So it's a little bit marketing and all that stuff. But, you know, like if I go down and play on the border in Harlingen, in Hop Shop, for example, a small club, 150 people, it's always packed, you know, or if, a, you know, like some of these other places outside of Austin. So, I mean, it just depends, you know, I don't necessarily have a method methodology to it. I just try to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the elephant in the room here, um, you, you, you are playing the role of Jason McMaster in this upcoming movie called Bloody and Bruised the untold story of the back room. And for people that aren't familiar, the back room was a legendary music venue here in Austin, Texas. It stayed open for 30, 35 years. Some a, a pretty incredible run saw mm -hmm. all kinds of music uh, come through there. Uh, you know, an unknown Pearl jam played there. unknown stone temple pilots played there. dangerous toys got recognized there. Mm -hmm. um, Pantera played there. Uh, so they put together this documentary and they ask you to play the role of a young Jason McMaster fronting dangerous toys back in the day for some of these reenactment scenes. How did you get that gig? So I guess it was just random one day. So I got a message on Facebook from John Ju, the producer. And he's like, Hey man, he goes, I saw a picture of you standing next to Matt Bray. You know, he's a singer from LC rocks. And cause I guess they use that as a gauge to see what my height and everything, you know, were. And obviously they, they heard my name thrown around and all that stuff. But when they saw that picture, he contacted me and said, you would, you look like a younger Jason or we can make you look like a younger Jason. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm down. So I, I got the thing and, and then we started talking and then they gave me a call and they told me what to do. And then it's pretty much it. Pretty seamless process. Did you, um, were you familiar with Jason's, you know, stage presence and mannerisms? Did you have to study video? What were there any challenges or any uh, any any mannerisms you had to study and adapt? He didn't. He didn't call me so I could show him some moves. It, <laughs> I didn't, didn't have the Jason McMaster dance class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've I've always known who Dangerous Toys uh, are slash were because like when I was a kid, I remember like in Rhode Island and Providence, we have a radio station called uh, HJY. And they used to have a segment every, every between noon and one every day called hair in your lunch. And they would always play scared by dangerous toys. But back when VH1, this is all going to tie together back in VH, when VH1 would air music videos, I think it was, head, it wasn't headbangers ball, but like at like two, three in the afternoon, when I'd come home from high school, they would always air these videos and scared would always be on there. So I knew the song. 
so I've always been familiar, but I didn't really do a deep dive into them until this role. Now, because obviously I'm representing Jason, I want to make sure I do a good job and make sure I, I pay homage to the band because, you know, he's, he's done everything I've wanted to do. So basically I watched tons of tape of them playing at the back room or in Dallas or whatever. And I would just, while I was on the treadmill at the gym, I would just watch his moves and his mannerisms because it's not, it's not so much the things wrong way, Jason, it's complicated what he does. Like me, I'm I'm a little bit more animated than Jason. Jason's more like lumbering and all that stuff. So I wanted to make sure that I capture that vibe correctly and represent him instead of injecting what I would do into it because it's not me, it's him. Does right. that make sense? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Like, what did you have to do to adapt your natural personality to sort of re recreate Jason, a different person altogether? Well, Jason's also a little bit more laid back. So it was great to like actually spend time with him one on one and all that stuff. Well, that was actually after the movie, but like just just hearing people talk about him and I was watching some of the interview clips, you know, he's just he's just very laid back and very confident and uh, you know, no bullshit type guy. So it's just like, all right, so you know, I'm no bullshit, very confident, but I'm also way more animated. So I was like, okay. So I just kind of just had to think of, you know, how how would I want to see it? You know what I mean? How I want, you know, so how would I see it through his eyes? So, like I said, it was more or less just a lot of studying. I did it for like a month and I wanted to make sure that like, hopefully he'll be happy with it. <laughs> so well, we, Jason, we haven't you seen, seen any the, of this? I, oh, I haven't, I haven't seen any clips that, okay. that actually have the, these physical reenactments I've seen. The only thing I've seen is, um, is like uh, stills that people were taking with their phones and then posting on uh, social media going, hey, I'm at, you know, this und undisclosed location watching these guys do a reenactment for the movie and da 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 da. And I was like, hey, wait, that's, you know, that looks like the toys. And hey, wait a minute, there's my Texas flag pants. And before I had seen those said still photos, I think the first thing, I think I had heard, caught wind about the movie. And then the next thing I see, uh, I guess it was from you, Christian. Uh, and I didn't know who you were. I didn't know anything about you. I had never heard your name or anything. I see the, uh, the, the receipt or the invoice for your, uh, for your hire, for your daily uh, paycheck or something. Mm -hmm. And you had you had posted it uh, publicly, yeah. And it had my name on it. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, "What in the literally out loud? What the fuck yeah. is this with my name on it? <laughs> you know, who do I call? Who am I getting mad at? And is this money for me? It has my fucking name on it. Where hey, something for you know, something for Big Daddy. That's my fucking name." And uh, with my very little in investigative uh, experience, I I real oh 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 harmless. <laughs> it's harmless, uh, harmless throws on the on social media. Go here, you know, like here's what I did today, kind of thing. So then I yeah, realized yeah, of course. what was going on and who you were, and I I cooled my jets. But that was, it was, uh, at first I was like, dude, wait a minute. Hey, uh-uh, uh-uh. But, uh, but then I quickly realized. So, so how, so Jason, yeah. let me just interrupt real quick. Okay. I'm sorry. No, but how, do. how does it, how does it feel knowing that there's somebody out there playing you in a movie? That well, it had to be, it, it, it had, you can imagine me first seeing the, um, you know, the daily receipt. You know what he like as as a movie extra, it was a it was an invoice kind of a thing, right? Christian, am mm -hmm. I pretty much okay? Yeah. And, and um, the fact that he kept it and and took a picture of it and posted it, you know, that takes some energy. And I, since I've come to know Christian a little bit, he's a go getter. So now all of the things that Christian posts. I understand why he's posting them and I get it because he's kind of a one man show and he's a go getter and he's, he's trying to rock. He's trying to get out there. He's got a band looking for a gig, right? Have, have band will travel. So I get that. Now to your question, um, I don't know 
really how it feels. Flattery is uh, is the first the first thing. Um, I had to go back to in my head. I had to go back to what the fuck are these guys doing with this movie, telling the story, and then doing these reenactments of shit that just happened in the movie. I had to get over that bump as well because I didn't understand the idea. Yeah. They're reenacting the bands that played there, and they're not only just telling documentary style the story. They reenact the reenactments make me feel like it's like a murder mystery. You know the way that they have it. They don't have the actual footage of, you know, Charlie Manson's, you know, little piggies going into Sharon Tate's. You know, that's there was no security footage <laughs> of that investig investigative reporting, right? There was no security footage where they now this might be disturbing on the five on the five o'clock news. We're actually going to show Charlie Manson's piggies going into you know they can do that shit now, right? So yeah. when I think of the way that they're making the movie, it it, it makes me think of those uh, you know Dateline or whatever where they're reenactment. Okay, I had to realize that that's what they were trying to do. Yeah. And at well, that point, so, gotta... so there was, you know, I was seeing the photos and to be, if I may be brutally honest, and I, I don't mean any harm to the crew and whoever's hiring and makeup and hair and, you know, some of the guitars were like Danny's, whoever was playing Danny Aaron, the guitar was too high. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to think about um, the hair and what's going on, you know. Uh, I'll, uh, Scott's guitar was was too low. Scott would never wear his wear his guitar that low, and and it, and it's like they got it wrong. Like Scott Scott's guitar is too low, and Danny's guitar is too high, and then <laughs> and then I'll I'll let you dig in in a minute. And this is just like face value. I'm going, and I'm not like going on social media going, uh, uh that's all wrong. Nope, it didn't look like that. That's wrong. I I was just you know going hmm interesting and just observations right sure and and in the way that i remember it you know someone who was there so you would, you would know yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and then <laughs> which you know everybody in, in a band has their own personality and so that's you get to know that personality and you know the quality control is is whoever the quality you know whoever they have for quality control that's who i would have been able to give advice to well, to be fair, Christian kind of does have the Jason hair. I mean, he's got the yeah. long reddish yeah, hair. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you put any 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 light light and probably not because back then no. my hair, I mean, I I'm going white like Gandalf or something. Uh <laughs> but my hair is actually that color that Christian has. It's actually a darker uh I'm a ginger. I'm a total ginger. But Yeah, mine's like a reddish brown. <laughs> yeah, I was going to I was going to make the point finally getting around to to Christian and just the, like I said the stills that I saw uh, because, you know, these were done in silhouette. All the guys were backlit to give everybody listening some sort of visual. And I, I believe those still shots are on social media. You can look them up probably under yep. under the uh, bloody and bruised social media uh, places and yep. uh, and or probably Christian's. Christian probably might be the one that posted those being the uh, media whore that he is. Yes, and that's that's a good thing. A good way, yeah. Yeah. So the uh, the here's here's an interesting thing because I don't really recall. Like back in the old days, there is most shows that were taped or you know videoed, right? Uh, Pre-internet. I'm using a microphone stand, and I've I've got the mic in my left hand, and I'm holding the rest of the mic stand down low kind of and sometimes i've got it planted uh vertical but most of the time i carried it around like it was like i was you know darth maul or some shit and uh and i'm right-handed so when i threw chuck the stand i'm singing with my right hand holding the mic with my right hand do you recall if that was any oh yeah yin and yang to what your what your attack was so that was definitely important because I find that you mentioned that because I'm left-handed. I'm actually not right-handed, even though I play every instrument right-handed, I'm left-handed, but I noticed I was one of the things I paid attention to 
because I basically told the guys for the visually when I was talking to the director of the movie, I was like, I want to make sure because he holds this a certain way. And when you hold the mic stand a certain way, that dictates your body movement. So yeah, I wanted to focus on that so I could make sure I got the movements correctly. Because like you, like you said, there's times where you planted it. Like I just recall the um, the Sport and a Woody video, right? When it does the, the slower breakdown in, in the bridge. No, right? you mean you mean tease and pleasing. Tease and pleasing. Sorry, tease yeah, and pleasing. That's all right. Because uh, we that's... did we did reenactments for um, those two. We didn't do a reenactment for Scared. That's why. Okay. Um, so I just remember when you're doing that, like there's like a I made sure to copy those manuals what you did because it was like a very performative aspect to something that you did, and you did it, you know, night after night. So I was like, okay, this is some moves that he likes to gravitate towards and do. So anything you did very repetitively. I tried to duplicate. Now, I don't know what made the final cut of the film, but it was more or less I paid attention to your handedness, how you held the mic stand, where you held it, because just on stage, like kind of like going through the motions, and even when I was kind of doing some stuff at home, I didn't really do too much at home, to be honest, because I had it all in my head and more or less getting into that. I'm like a headspace guy. So when I was actually on set and saw how everything was placed, I was like, okay, this is, you know, this is how much depth and everything I have to work with. This is where the cameras are. This is where the lights are. So you have to be aware of that. You know, acting isn't just, or, or reenacting isn't just getting up there and just going through the motions. You have to be aware of all these moving pieces or non-moving pieces. So again, not to make a long story longer, but um, it was more or less, I was conscious to make sure I had that because that was very particular to the way that you performed. And like I said, now you like, you don't necessarily use a stand. Like obviously we played with you. So I saw that. Uh, but it was more or less the backroom performances. We used the mic stand. We focused on that. There was mm. maybe one time we ran through where I was, you know, freehand with just the mic, not with, um, not with a mic stand, but it was a little weird though, to, to hold it in my right hand versus my left. Cause I mean, obviously I play guitar right-handed, but if I hold a mic, I'm going to, you know, hold it in my left hand. So I don't know, but that well, was that. It, there's an interesting h historical uh, sort of timeline because in in the old Watchtower days, this would have been, you know, 82 through 88. I never mm -hmm. used a mic stand. When I started working with the toys, I incorporated the mic stand, I think, because I wanted there to be something different about the way that I was moving and singing. Because what I do necessarily in Watchtower is this maniacal crazy rolling around on the ground sometimes. And, and so it was a different, you know, wanted there to be kind of something different about it. And I don't even recall it being a case study to where uh, I just knew that it was going to feel different. So I wanted there to be uh, a way that sort of helped me make it different without thinking about it too much, if that makes any sense. No, it makes it perfect so I sense. Brought, I brought in another tool to sort of help me basically relearn how to sing rock and roll because after so long of, of singing this crazy thrash stuff, it's a bit of a different approach because there's a little bit more melody and there's uh, different sources that I'm using, right? So mm -hmm. at some time, if you, and then if you, and then it's, we're off and running, Sometime in the the early to mid nineties, as far as me fronting uh, toys, I, I I I less and less used the mic stand, and ultimately I think I lost you know Chuck the mic stand altogether. You guys want to guess why? You don't want to carry it around. Smaller stages. Uh, so if I had a mic that. stand and I'm using it and I'm hitting the guitar player and I'm hitting the bass player, so smaller mm -hmm. stages that there's no room for me to use a mic stand. I'm fucking shit up up here. So <laughs> yep. I, I just went with just holding the mic like I did in the old days. And now I think that it's just a better feel for me. I'm more comfortable and things like that as far as the history of how that of how that went. But, you know, the the idea of uh of you being that must have worked out okay being that you're left-handed and using the mic stand because that's that makes sense yep. to me to when i hold a mic stand my my right hand is low and my my the yep. mic is in my left hand yeah you kind of like this position but another thing i wanted to add that you did a lot is you would hold the mic over the crowd a lot so yeah. using the mic stand you could do that yeah yeah, 
Yeah, yeah. May, maybe in some, it depends on it depends on uh, if the crowd was thick. If it was thin, there was not a whole lot of that going on. Well, but the videos I watched is, was absolutely packed, so you would, right. you would thrust the mic, whatever. So that's a very rock and roll move. So, um, like I said, I get it. <laughs> it actually yeah, just good. I made sure to try to do all of that. Well, did you did you have to audition? I, I didn't hear that part of the story. You didn't audition. You just got they called you. They hey, you might be a good candidate. Could show up and we'll fit you for some Texas flag pants. <laughs> So this is how it went. So they obviously knew they were asking around uh, John Jew was and Boudreaux. They were asking around, I guess, to my knowledge, maybe if you talk to them, they can they can touch on it from their perspective. From my understanding is people have seen me perform. They know how I perform. They knew I would be great. They're like, oh, he looks like young Jason. You know, let's put some fake tattoos on him because I don't have any and, you know, put him in the thing. But I didn't audition. I told the, the, the director I was like, I was like, I don't have any acting experience because the reenactments there's a little bit more visual elements going on, right? It's not necessarily because obviously we're reenacting stuff as you're narrating whatever you're talking about in that particular scene. Like we're reenacting the phone call with the, the record label and all that stuff. But there's certain things he wanted to capture and certain movements that have to be a little bit more dramatic or whatever for, for the camera. But that stuff was more or less he just coached it, coached us through it on the fly. But, um, you know, obviously they had to take my measurements for pants and stuff like that. But they, when I told him that, he's just like, here, watch these videos, just study him. If you have any questions, you'll be, but we think you'll be perfect. We think you'll be fine. And then, you know, when I got on there, you know, I was the lead for that day because I was playing you and I had more uh, parts than every, anybody else. And that was the day sheet. Obviously, like you said, I made sure I omitted certain information, of course. Um, but yeah, it was more or less, we did like a couple rehearsals and he's like, he's like, Christian, you're getting this, you're nailing it. And he's like, I was like, yeah, because like, you know, I've think from other things that I've done, you know, just being situationally aware and also me being um, like a visual and thinking like, kind of like how you do Jason and stuff like visualizing everything in my head before it happens. I look at it as how do I want to see it? And that helped me get through the process. You so I guess. That natural as they say i don't know you guys well you're that. you're a front man and i'm i'm not i'm not hard to mimic like you said there's not a lot really going on it's it's really just you would only need probably the uh, the few mannerisms that i have in order to get that and i i think the mic stand is a that's why i brought that up because i think that it for back then it was a it was a thing that i was doing that would have probably given you a solid anchor to be able to do the mannerisms that you would have needed to pull off. Yeah. Yeah. And then I'm sure you did a great job. I'm sure you oh, did a fine you. job. Thank yeah. you. I hope I got big shoes to fill or, or well, big fills, to re, uh, big shoes to reenact, but it was more or less, they wanted there, to capture. It's only nine and a half. <laughs> I actually it's think the, I have a bigger shoe. It's the pants you got to worry about. Yeah. You're so taller. Have... He's taller than me, Dave. He's and a little I keep, taller I than me. I keep hearing about the Texas flag pants, Jason's legendary <laughs> Texas flag pants. So, you know, the... I was doing an interview. Sorry to interrupt. You know, I was doing an interview a couple of weeks ago uh, with this guy who calls himself old head. And it was a really fun interview. And he, he literally said, do you still have those pants? And I said, one moment. <laughs> and I left the microphone and I went and brought the pants and I'm holding the pants okay. up on this camera right here. So you guys look up old head and look at the interview that I did with, with him. And, and so that's, that's where I was going real. with this. Did, did, did he sent me a picture, Dave, did not to interrupt you. He sent me a picture. I asked him about it and he sent me a picture and he's like, yep, there's still in a box in my garage. He says, <laughs> So, so you didn't actually wear the actual pants. They, you had them. They, they were made to look like they were a replica. Basically, they won't even fit the the original pants would not even fit on Christian's arm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just so you know, they barely fit on my arm. Well, so. those those are some classic pants. And and again, uh, attention to detail. Uh, credit to the guys making the movie. Yes. They went out of their way to make sure they had the pants right. The mic stand, as as Jason is saying, to sort of sort of time stamps that period in dangerous toys career so you know uh att attention to detail I, I love it i love it the Texas i wanted to wear the replica pants at the show we opened for dangerous toys but the director was like no 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 he's like we gotta keep some things under wraps i was like ah oh, because i wanted to, to do it to see if jason would say something but they told me no <laughs> so do you you own that would have been now? weird no. so I'm, that would have okay. been weird i'm glad they uh glad they were smart enough to keep you from that <laughs> you, you, you got too much energy I, i'm i'm jealous um 
The uh, speaking of the pants, I recently signed them for auction to raise money f- to finish the movie. Oh, oh, that's yeah. where oh, those pants oh. are. They went up for auction to raise money. That don't. I'm telling you what I did. They those pants have my. I think I signed the star. You know where the star is, right? Uh, yeah. Right. It's on the cock. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's on the. It's on the. It's on the cockpit. So yeah, wherever the cockpit is, that's where my autograph is now. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I think those are for up for auction to raise money to finish the film. So that's wow. a great idea. Yeah, that's great. I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. So, yeah. uh, are there any? Did you have any speaking roles in this movie as Jason, or are you basically on stage just reenacting some live performances? There's not any speaking roles. Uh, it's more or less reenactments. Maybe there were some scenes where I mouthed some words or whatever. But like there's 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 B roll in our in uh, reenactments, like how Jason would be with the crowd. We reenact, you know, where he brushed off the record label uh, A&R rep, like just key moments that he talks about in the narration. Um, that's what I did. So it's like maybe six or seven scenes. Uh, Boudreaux can touch on that more. Like I said, the day was kind of a blur because I was way too excited. <laughs> I I can't. Uh, that's normal for you. I can't. Yes. Uh, you can't help it. You got energy to boot. Um, I am really cringy about the scene where you, me, are brushing off a uh, little Celine Armback from SBK Music. She, technically, the publishing company, not not the record label, is what okay. who Celine worked for. But that happened right there by the men's bathroom, right there at the old back room, right just stage left. Um, I'm wondering if they got that that detail right. And I'm wondering how much of an asshole you had to act like in that scene. I hope it was like to measure it in uh, sandpaper. I'm hoping it was a very, uh, very high grit I just remember I, I can't I I I I can't comment on it. I don't think Boudreaux will let me. But no, it was uh it was interesting. We'll just say that it was interesting. Okay. But uh, I don't think it's I think it's not it's not uh as evil as the as that. I think it's more or less just it's good. it's a little bit more playful, a little bit more tongue in cheek. Oh but good, okay. It gets, it gets the point across, yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, to be clear and just while I'm thinking about it, because uh, you know, obviously she became our immediate ally uh, within 48 hours of our meeting. Um, But the gut reaction that I had towards her uh, when first approached was pretty much how I described it uh, in the interview for the film, which was uh, this, I'm not even in this band, but, but you can go talk to those guys right over there. They're, they're right there. There's no backstage. They're just standing there pulling gear off the stage, you know? Yeah. And that was pretty much it. Um, I think that's what I, what I said though, is I think I copied that line, what you said verbatim, go talk to those suckers over there or whatever you said. That's, I think that's the only line I said. (laughs) uh, Okay. Okay. Well, I'm glad she did, or I wouldn't be here today. Yeah, it's just it, it's 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 been that way sometimes too. When I'm at shows and stuff, where people will try to come up to you at a show and they want to talk, well, let me book you on this show or whatever. And I'm always like, yeah, 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 whatever, dude. I'm working. I was like, if you're serious, contact me afterwards. And then some people are like, nah, dude. Like, and I'm like, oh, okay, I'm sorry. It's just because you get a lot of people, and you know this from playing back in the back in the day, and even now, you get a lot of people that come up to you, and I don't say that think that they're ill intentioned, but they don't necessarily. I don't know how to word this without sounding like an asshole, but they don't necessarily have something to offer you of substance. You know what I mean? And they also don't know the ins and outs of what you're doing. So whereas they think they might be helping, you'd be like, I'm already got that covered tenfold or something. You know what I mean? And it's not that I'm brushing them off like, you know, fuck you or whatever. It's just like, you know, hey, man, like I'm at a show. My mindset's in show mindset. I'm interacting with fans. If you want to talk business or something like that, here's my phone number. Here's my email. You know, we can talk after the show. You know, I don't think there's anything that's a pressing matter that needs to be discussed now. Like, oh, you need to be on a plane tomorrow. Like, that's like fantasy and not reality. So, yeah, there's a time and a place to talk business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. that's for sure. That's for sure. Yeah. But, you know, 
during that it, si- that during that situation back then it was it was like uh you know the story behind that just to give a little bit more insight is you know she had seen onyx play which is basically dangerous toys without me with a girl singer with a different name the year before and she came back the next year which would have been this encounter and was watching Onyx play with a whole new set of, with a whole new band because mm-hmm. she had left what was the old Onyx, which is now Dangerous Toys with me. Mm-hmm. And she had a new band. And so, all right, I'm going back. It's been a year. I'm going to go see how they've developed. And, you know, Celine is watching Onyx downtown somewhere. And she's like leaning over to somebody going, something's different about this band. Yeah, there, there's a, they got a thrash metal singer and they're called Dangerous Toys. They're playing right now at the back room. Give me a cab. The rest is history. Wow. Wow. Some so, things are meant to be. Yeah. So, so uh, this movie, uh, Bloody and Bruised, the untold story of the back room is has been submitted for South by Southwest 2024. And we're all hoping and crossing our fingers that it gets accepted and that it will make its screen debut in March of 2024 during South by Southwest. Um, So since we're talking about it, I wanted to make people aware of when they could look for this and and expect to see it and watch Christian perform as, as Jason. And I think anybody that's been around Austin and even people that didn't necessarily grow up here, it's going to be a really good movie because it's rare that a the club has a run for that long, 30, 35 years. And when you, you know, when you do roll call of some of the names that went through those doors, it's pretty impressive. And Jason can speak to this. Uh, all those touring bands that went through the back room, um, they know it. They they remember that that venue. So I think it's got, you know, obviously it's got some appeal for an Austin audience, but I think it's got a a much wider appeal because a lot of bands went through there um, that made a big name for themselves. And so it's recognized not only in Texas, but around the world, around the country, for sure. Well, to comment on that, Dave, being up in Rhode Island as a kid, you know, the the clubs that I always heard about were the Whiskey in L.A. and, you know, CBG, was it CBGB's in New York? Yeah. That's what everybody talked about. Nobody yeah. talked about Austin up there. I didn't even know what Austin was, to be honest. And then when people started telling me about it before I came down, like it's the live music capital of the world. And I went, it's the live music capital of the world. How come I've never heard of it? So well, that was just because, me being- Because that is this bumper sticker. That's not the truth. <laughs> well, well, I get it. But, but, but I was just, I was intrigued by that. And, but now it's kind of interesting how, you know, Austin is going to have a movie about its club and the, and the bands that, you know, cut their teeth down here and all that stuff. And so hopefully it could be on par with the whiskey and all that stuff. It's just unfortunate that the whiskey is the only club that exists out of the three. The other two don't anymore. So, yeah. but it's just an interesting little, little thing, little, little thing that I thought of when I heard about it. I just, I mean, I love music history. I used to watch all those documentaries on every band club tour, whatever, because I just wanted, I was hungry for knowledge. I mean, I'm still hungry for knowledge. Like, I want to learn everything about everybody. That's why I ask Jason a million questions all the time. <laughs> well, obviously, uh, we we needed you down here so you could play me in the movie. Let's let's see. We're making a movie about a, 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 a club that kicked a bunch of ass and created a bunch of cool vibes and, and saw a lot of bands come and go and get their career started and blah, 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 blah. Let's get this kid from Rhode Island to play a Texan, <laughs> which I think is but- ironic and really <laughs> awesome at the same time. It yeah. is. And, uh, you know, there was a culture around the club, right? You know, people talk oh, about, yeah. cause we, we, cause like, obviously Dave's a huge kiss fan too. You know, Paul Stanley always talks about, uh, phenomenons impact society. Right. So with music, there's been all these cultural shifts, right? We've seen it through the decades and all that stuff. So that was like a big culture down here. So I think it's, it's awesome to be part of that culture because, you know, being in Austin, you know, some people not, might not like me saying this since I'm not from Austin, but an outsider, it feels like, you know, I've been here for eight years. When I first moved here, you know, fast forward eight years, it feels like it's becoming more of like a techno hub and it, or, or tech hub rather, not techno music, tech hub. And it's like losing like the allure of, of, you know, what, what it's known for, for bands. I mean, bands still play everywhere, but there's like, I'm not hearing anything that's like really like, Ooh, what's going on over here. It's kind of like, hey, everybody's doing everything, you know, yeah. there's nothing that's sticking out. 
that's that's a, that's a good that's way fair, to, that's that's totally fair and and if you look at the progress of the city as well as its uh things that have made it cool like uh you know uh keep austin weird is not let's have purple hair uh, keep austin weird is a campaign to remind people to not shop at walmart and buy locally mm-hmm. eat locally shop locally buy local from local artisans local companies etc cetera, etc cetera. so you know that kind of had blown up and you know yeah austin's weird all right bunch of weird you know what that's that is the they missed the point Live yeah, yeah. music capital of the world, same thing. It's a, it's a slogan, just like Keep Austin Weird. It's a slogan. It's not the live music capital of the world. Chicago or New Orleans, those would be live music capital of the world, if you ask me. But that's just me. So I feel like this idea for this movie is where I'm going. While you, were, you said a bunch of beautiful things, but the whole time I'm thinking, you know, they could, whoever powers it be, you know, uh, in the Midwest could make movie about the Aragon ballroom. Uh, New York and New Jersey could get together and make a movie about Lemoore's. Uh, there's all of these pockets that had these uh, phenomenons as to quote, to your, go back to your Paul Stanley quote, that's a phenomenon because everyone who talks about Lemoore's, they know about the back room. Yeah. Everyone who's yeah. played the Aragon Ballroom and uh, and you know th- through Ohio and and uh, you know Illinois and, so, and dude, they know about the back room. Um, the Aragon Ballroom had these different tiers. They had the big room and they had the small room. But you have the little theater and then the big sort of you know kind of real big uh, uh, theater kind of a, a vibe, which was really cool because. It would be gigs going on at the same time. And that is, those are music cities to me. In the Midwest, they what we do and what we talk about here, they love it in the Midwest. Yeah, I actually haven't All spent a lot of time. Year. Yeah, I haven't spent a lot of time playing the Midwest. I just, I haven't been able to get up there. I mean, I, mean, I played in old bands in like Kansas and stuff, but, you know, I'd love to, I think if I make my way up that way, they'd really like what I'm doing as well to further yeah. more what you're saying. Yeah. Chicago be, area, you know, there's a couple places in Indiana. It's on the list. Good. It's going to be interesting to see how that movie does and what kind of attention it brings to Austin. Uh, because to Jason's point, and that's the point I was trying to make earlier, is there's an audience for anything related to the back room that goes well beyond the city of Austin because it was that club that was on the circuit. If you were playing Lemoore's, you were playing the back room and then you were making your way to the whiskey. And, you know, so it, it was part of that circuit. So it is part of the culture and it lasted a long time. And I guess, you know, there's icing on the cake too. If you look at some of the bands that ended up being huge, that came through there, that that's intriguing as well. Right. So it'll just be interesting to see, um, I, I feel like the movie's in very good hands. The creative team that's behind it, Penny Rock Productions, uh, Boudreaux and John, and and the whole staff. I mean, they, they've got a, quite a team, uh, but they paid attention to detail, I think, and they are qualified, I think, to tell the story. And to their credit, they brought in other people to help tell the story, Jason included. Um, so I, I think it's going to be great. I can't wait to see it. It's and, no uh, surprise that every everything on uh, behind Dave uh, on the wall, pretty much everything back there, uh, has played at the back room as well as his T-shirt. Yep, dirty looks. Same, yep. same with my T-shirt. All Armored these, Saint. the bands that they they have all played at the back room. What about Guns and Roses? I don't know if you can see it that well. No, they they yeah. didn't. They're they're they're. I that don't picture. think that they they did a club uh, through here. They opened for the first time in Austin. I want to say they were opening for the Cult, and that was at uh, Palmer Auditorium on down on Town Lake, and uh, and then I saw them Guns and Roses still talking at the Cameo Theater, which only holds about five hundred people down in San Antonio. Mm-hmm. So crazy, yeah, that, but like going going. What were you gonna say, Dave? Sorry. That picture right there that I'm pointing at—that's me and Tracy Guns. That's actually taken the week that the back room closed. So wow. that's uh, he was one of the last national acts to play 
the back room and that photo was taken that night. So yeah, a lot of backroom history uh, among the three of us now, Christian's in the movie and uh, I've got a bit part in the movie. Jason's obviously a, a focus of the movie along with many others. So, yep. And I just think it's about culture building. You know, one of the things everybody talks about where these old guys, no offense, Jason, they talk about the music industry. It's not an industry anymore, whatever. It's like, these guys need to build culture. And that's why I think that this movie is important. It reminds you of a time where just even looking up the history of the club, there was a culture around it. It didn't matter if you were in a hard rock, rock band, you know, a, a rap artist or whatever. They built a culture around this club where people knew that this was the place where people would go and mingle and find like-minded people. The beauty and the curse or the yin and yang of the internet is the culture is now global but also everybody siphoned off into little pockets and little bubbles. There's not like a centralized place on the internet where people go, you know? So what I want to try to figure out furthermore going into culture, especially with something like this is how do we get back to bridging those cultural gaps and making it more of like a Venn diagram, where everything overlaps. So that's just kind of like where my headspace was with it and with it. And I think that's what a lot of people, you know, forget. I mean, we get up our own in our own head or up our own ass, as they say, you know, because you get into like your headspace where like you think like one way is the absolute, but everything's always moving. So I yeah. just think that culture is what's important and what everybody's missing about about music. It's not about who's the best band. It's not about it's it's the culture. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things like we're rattling off the names of clubs around the country. And the reason that we're familiar, I mean, Jason's actually played them. I haven't, but I know Lemoore's and I know the whiskey and I know CBGB's. But to your point, Christian, one of the reasons those clubs are so well known is not only because of the music that came out of them, but as you said, they were sort of social hubs. So even on a night off, people were still that's where you went to hang out and be with your tribe and and that sort of thing. There's a million clubs that have opened and closed around this country, but the fact that we're able to name a handful, it's because not only did they have great music on the stage, but they were also a social hub for, for that community, the hard rock, punk rock, whatever the case may yeah. be. Yeah. And there's still, there's still a few around, but uh, like I said, I only, I, we just, we only named like two. <laughs> That's yeah. it, you know. So and tell us, the, bring us up to speed real quick uh, before we go. Tell us uh, about your your current music, what you're doing next. Give us the the quick summary of of Christian Shields and where you're going from this point. So uh, I'm going to put out a new single uh, November 10th it's called "Raise Them Up." There's going to be a video that goes with it, also directed by Penny Rock and Pudro. Uh, it came out awesome, great rock and party tune. Of course, I'm biased. Um, I think the direction is for 2024 uh, to record a couple new songs, videos, put them out, uh, possibly, you know, tour. But my new, my new headspace is this, too, to kind of like, uh, um, you know, since not doing albums anymore. I, because of the Internet, it's like the ultimate time capsule and time machine. Everything's relevant at all times because right here on your phone, you can pull up anything. So it's almost like the decades now don't like exist. Like you talk about nineties, thousands, but you don't talk about the 2010s, whatever. Again, not to get long winded, but basically you can just put out a song and just tour. Like you don't need to do a tour to support an album or whatever. They're not necessarily exclusive. So I think that's going to be the plans for next year is just to, you know, play shows that make sense, do what makes sense, do a couple songs and uh, just see what, what happens with this movie. If any, what other doors come of that, you know, Again, uh, there's a lot of things up in the air, and I don't want to com you know, uh, comment on speculation, so to speak. Right. Uh, tell, tell people where they can find you um, online. So my website is christianshieldsrocks.com, facebook.com slash christianshields, x slash twitter.com uh, slash christianshields, uh, or christianshields23, TikTok at christianshields23, Instagram at christianshieldslive. Yeah. And I would tell anyone listening or watching, if you're interested in getting a, a, a feel for what Christian's all about, the website is really well done. Uh, you've got your music and and some videos on there. Uh, it, it, the layout is great. It's very professional. Like Jason said earlier, you're one of those, you're one of these guys that is definitely the term I think is go getter. It's like everything that you do, you do well. And I think that's a, a real sign of professionalism and, uh, 
uh, I was listening to your to your music all this week, getting ready for this interview. And I was impressed with how well done the website is. So go check out ChristianShieldsRocks.com. Thank you. Um, you also got a YouTube channel with some videos and music. Oh, yeah. YouTube.com slash Christian Shields. You know, and you, I appreciate you calling me a go-getter, but I just come to realize, a lot. Uh, you know, it took me a little bit when I was a young, when I was younger. But as I got into my mid-20s, I realized that that phrase, no one's coming to save you, so to speak, is no one's going to do anything for you. You know, a lot of people, they're going to latch on to something that's, it's like, you got to think of it like a magnet, right? As it gets more power or more influence, you know, people start to gravitate towards it. You know, I just realized that, like, why am I asking these people to do something that I could do myself? Obviously, there's financial reasons for that as well. But, you know, I just try to do, I try to do what I think is best to further, you know, further, further move things along. But also, I don't like to try to, like, pat myself on the back, so to speak. You know, I do ruffle some feathers, like like Jason said, by posting the day sheet, because people see that and go, what the hell? It's like, you know what I mean? But yeah, it's, it's done a little bit on purpose, but you got you to gotta kind of do things, you know? I mean, I guess I guess what I'm saying is my social media is the ultimate highlight reel. You guys don't see the lows. You guys just see all the awesomeness. Oh, that's true of any social media account, I think, unless you're just yeah. masochist. Well, some people everybody post that. puts their everybody puts their best face forward on. on well, I'm also trying to promote like because obviously this is one of the the, the the interesting dichotomy because obviously my real name is Christian Shields. Christian Shields is a character I play on TV, as I like to say. The guy behind the scenes, like I separate the two. Nobody cares about the guy behind the scenes except for you know people that I'm close with. But you know, Christian Shields is the character. He's the rock star. He doesn't have a bad day. Yada yada yada. All that stuff. He's a positive, <laughs> shining light that people can gravitate towards. And I just, I want to bring people together. I want people to have a good time. I don't want people to be divisive over politics or whatever. Like we can all disagree, but we can also all find something to agree with. So it's, it's, it's just about having a good time, having fun and, and enjoying things, you know? So, you know, I always say there's only one politic, one religion, one creed that brings us all together. Do you guys know what that is? Rock and roll, baby. <laughs> Rock and roll. That's how I end every show. And I mean it. That's my mission statement. Yeah. Well, we love what you're doing. I love your ambition, your energy, uh, your enthusiasm, you know, your passion for what you do. It shows in all of the things that you put out there, your videos and your music, et cetera. So continued success with that. And uh, and good luck on the, the movie. I think we're all waiting to see that. That's going to be awesome. And uh, we thank you for spending some, some time with us today. Well, thank you guys for having me. Yeah, absolutely. On behalf of my co-host, Jason McMaster, I'm Metal Dave, along with our guest today, Christian Shields on the Talk Louder podcast.